afternoon to everyone in Europe and, and in the East, and good morning to uh, those of you who are in the USA. <clears throat> this, um, uh, this webinar is basically to uh, sort of give you an idea of how uh, process optimization and process improvement um, takes place if you're using uh, automated reactors and, and, and possibly automated parallel reactors in combination with um, uh, some form of, of DOE technique. Um, I just want to make it clear, um, I, I believe we did emphasize this before, that this is not um, a webinar for DOE training. So DOE is kind of in the background, and I'll mention where it plays a part. But really, it's about how um, uh, that technique is used and, and how it's used in conjunction with our, uh, our reactors. Ah, okay. Um, okay, so just to, for the first few minutes, I want to give you an idea of, for those uh, of you who are not familiar, the role that uh, statistical design of experiments or DOE or factorial design of experiments, the role that uh, this does play. Um, so what is a design experiment? Well, first and foremost, it's an it's a organized, pre-planned way of conducting uh, the, the research. Um, so basically, you are thinking about the whole process, organizing it, and, uh, and once you do that, the series of experiments that you're going to do and the order in which you're going to do them are totally defined. So you're not sort of doing an experiment, then deciding what to do next, doing another one, and so on. It's where you kind of think about the whole process at the beginning and then go ahead and do all the experiments and then review the results. So it, it's, it's, a, uh, it, it's a way in which you generate the data, analyze it all together, and then take that in steps. So the overall objective of the design of experiments is to gain an understanding of the, of the process. So you not only hopefully achieve the objective, but also you find out what things are important, what things are not important. So you generate a better understanding of the process than hopefully you had before you did that. So the design of experiments would be used to, uh, for example, quantify certain uh, relationships, uh, to determine which factors are important and where you have interactions between factors. By factors, I mean things like, let's say, temperature, pressure, stirring speed, and so on. So we basically want to test the significance of, of these parameters. So you may, say, um, decide that some variable is important, but then you actually find that actually uh, it plays no uh, result in the, um, uh, in the final objective. Um, of course, in general, you're trying to uh, optimize processes and predict the conditions under which uh, the optimal uh, would be observed. Um, also, and you'll see that in uh, at least two of the examples that I'm going to uh, handle, you are sort of trying to determine whether some of the opinions that may exist uh, are actually correct. And, uh, and sometimes, you know, rumor uh, tends to generate certain uh, so-called understandings, which in fact have no basis in reality. So you'll be able to do that sort of thing as well. And of course, a lot of development gets done um, on the lab scale, and, uh, and hopefully you'll be able to make the transition to pilot plant and, and production much more effectively if you uh, carry out this sort of uh, methodical process development or process evaluation. The uh, process itself, or the procedure itself, is outlined here um, in the form of these eight steps. So the first two are really the, the thoughts um, that you need to sort of put together before you ever get into the lab. So this would be, first of all, identifying and agreeing that there is a problem which needs to be solved. And of course, establishing the benefits of doing it because um, there'll be some investment involved in, um, in undertaking the task. So that's what would be um, the, the first sort of step before you um, actually get going. Assuming that um, the effort is justified, 
then you'd focus on the process and look at the factors which would um, uh, yeah, possibly influence the final result. So if you want to, uh, let's say, um, increase the yield, you'd have to think about what factors you think will influence the yield. And, uh, and in conjunction with those factors, um, uh, identify what responses would be used to measure the effects of the, uh, of the factors. So when you are doing this, of course, sometimes it's uh, you know, a group exercise where people um, uh, you know, identify certain things that they believe would be important, because this is an important step. If you um, uh, decide on too many factors, then of course you end up uh, doing lots and lots of experiments. On the other hand, if you leave important factors out, then you could completely um, uh, miss uh, the, the optimal solutions. So this is an important step. Once you've done that, then um, you basically move to the designing of the experiments. In other words, how you're going to do it in terms of um, the, uh, the sequence, the, which experiments to do next, and, and so on and so forth. And this is where you may go into the DOE software, uh, which, um, as I said, we're not going to do in any detail. But once you've identified what you're going to do, the, the next thing is really to decide the sequence of experiments and then basically perform the experiments. Um, and we'll look um, at several examples of how to do that and what's important in terms of the tools you use. Once you've done all of the experiments, you would then analyze the data uh, together. Uh, and that's important to emphasize that it's only once you have all of the data that you can start making sense of it and drawing some preliminary conclusions. And, uh, and once you draw those conclusions, you may be able to make recommendations immediately. But in a lot of cases, you may have to then think about doing some further experiments and then what the next step would be. So um, the uh, sort of the statistical design part of it that we're going to be using quite a lot is this uh, process of uh, two-level factorial experiments, which basically means that for each of the factors that you identify, let's say temperature, pressure, stirrer speed, um, typically you're going to um, work at a low value of that factor and a high value. So those are the, the two levels. So, for example, if you think typically a process is operated at uh, 50 degrees centigrade, then for the purpose of this experiment, you might choose to do experiments at 40 and 60 degrees. So that's how you choose the levels of the two factors. And then depending on the number of factors, two raised to that power would give you the total number of experiments or the minimum um, number of experiments you're, you're going to need to do. So here, for example, if there were only two factors, then you'd need to do a minimum of two. If there were six factors, then a minimum of 64. And when I say a minimum, then, uh, of course, you may choose to repeat some. Uh, there may be some baseline experiments that you do, standards and that sort of thing. So that's why the actual number may be a little bit more than that, um, but not a lot more than that. Um, and then once you actually get into the experiments, having designed the, the, the sequence and the details of it, you then conduct the experiments and then go on to analyze the data. And in, in analyzing the data, more than likely, as you'll see in some of the examples that I'll go through, you'll find that you'll need to do more experiments. So you take advantage of the information you've got. Maybe it... Um, uh, sort of uh, uh, points in a, in a particular direction and, and then you would um, uh, basically design another set of experiments and then, uh, and then analyze the data again. So there may be a couple of iterations involved in getting to the final solution, not always. And, uh, and at the end of it, your results might be, for example, ex capable of being expressed in a sort of a, um, a surface uh, result like this. So, for example, uh, you, you can state that at um, some temperature um, on this axis, some catalyst amount on this, that this is, for example, the uh, uh, conversion that you get or the uh, or, uh, um, selectivity that you get. And then, uh, you know, for example, if yellow is the desired um, 
<coughs> objective, then you can then see what uh, combinations of the parameters that are important would give rise to uh, the desired uh, results. So you get a, a, an understanding of what the consequences of going outside of that region is and also how uh, much flexibility you have whereby you would still be in that region. So um, the bigger this area, for example, then you'd know that actually the process is quite flexible and you're not being restricted to a very uh, narrow operating range. <clears throat> Okay, so let's now go to uh, the first case study. This is a, a very simple one, which I'm going to basically skip through. Uh, but it is based on a real problem. It's basically a, a, a plant-related uh, problem where uh, crystallization of uh, an, a, an API was giving uh, rise to problems. And basically, the problem was that um, there were um, frequent uh, faulty batches and so obviously productivity was, was poor and, uh, and, and the client wanted to understand why and, and if possible to eliminate these faulty batches. They could tell um, that a, a batch was faulty by just looking at the crystal size and shape. So this became an important um, input in order to be able to uh, analyze the process because each time we would do an experiment, we could quickly see whether or not the, uh, the results were satisfactory. <clears throat> the client identified that these are the five parameters which um, were important in determining the final results. So solvent impurity, initial solute concentration, stirring speed, um, the rate of cooling, um, in order to um, uh, crystallize, and then the presence or absence of, of seeding. So this would be something that um, the people who are involved in the process and have some knowledge of it uh, would go through in order to identify that. And as I said before, you don't want to have too large a list so that it takes too long, but on the other hand, you don't want to risk missing an important parameter. So. If we do a, a, a two-level factorial design uh, for these uh, um, uh, parameters, then, of course, it gives rise to um, uh, 32 uh, experiments that, uh, that need to be done, um, and, and that's what we, uh, we undertook. Uh, these experiments were done unusually on, on a single reactor. Um, as you'll see, all the uh, other examples will be on multiple parallel re reactors. But the, the important thing about the choice of reactor is that it should give you um, good control. In other words, that you get reproducible results. And, uh, and ideally, that you are logging data so you can see uh, what's happening, uh, and which basically means it has to be ideally an automated reactor. The ability to reproduce, in other words, do an experiment um, over and over again a couple of times and show that you get exactly the same results is essential. Because as you can imagine, what you're doing is looking at the effect of, let's say, two different temperatures. And you can only um, sort of rely on that sort of data if you know that uh, the uh, results that you get when you repeat an experiment uh, are reliable. So, the choice of tool is important, and that's why um, I'm doing an example where only one reactor was involved, but importantly, it was a reactor that's fully automated and, uh, and therefore uh, could be used to produce uh, reliable uh, information. Now, this is just an example of it. So, for example, we're heating the crystals here to dissolve them and then cooling to recrystallize, and here you have um, an indication of where the crystallization occurs. And we've got data for uh, at least two uh, repeat cycles here, and you can see that both the temperature uh, history and the point at which crystallization occurs are totally uh, reproducible. And this is what you want to be able to demonstrate before you get into um, details uh, of the project. In this particular case, the conclusions were um, that there were only two important variables of the five that were originally suggested, 
and those two were the uh, stirring speed and the water content of the solvent. Um, once these were identified, of course, you want to then um, think about why this would have been a problem on the plant and see whether or not it makes sense. In this particular case, it most definitely did because the settings for stirrer speed were not very accurate. Um, they was, the operator was simply required to uh, set a dial at a, at a position and this wasn't even particularly uh, emphasized in particular detail and so it's quite likely that different operators would have stirred at different speeds on different days. The water content of the solvent again did make sense because from one batch to the next they would use the same solvent so the solvent was being recycled and clearly um, the moisture content would, would increase with, with each batch. Um, and so the, the uh, solutions to both of these problems obviously were also quite, um, quite easy to, um, to ascertain, um, uh, to put better control on the stirrer motors, to maybe have digital indication. And then as far as the solvent is concerned, the solution was simply to stop recycling, which in this case was not an expensive step. So the lessons uh, for us in terms of this particular exercise is that you can use a single uh, computer controlled re laboratory reactor to uh, conduct the, uh, uh, the uh, optimization experiments. But what you have to keep in mind is that it would take a long time. So here, I believe the project took us something like three to four months just because of the number of experiments that had to be performed. So in general, what you want to do is to be able to operate in parallel, and that's what we're going to do for the next uh, three examples. Um, this one involves a fine chemicals process where um, there is a reaction between reagents A and B. Uh, a is added to the reactor at the beginning and B is dosed over, over time. Um, C is a, a, a component which is added but doesn't actually take part in the stoichiometry. And in fact, in discussion with the client, no one could really say whether or not C was even necessary. So uh, this was an important um, um, a piece of information to identify at the beginning. So basically it's a semi-batch uh, process where A and C are added at the beginning and B is dosed over time. The objective was to uh, reduce the batch cycle time. So they wanted to ideally to be able to increase productivity by having shorter batches. Another important part of reducing the batch time was to have uh, fewer uh, failed batches. Um, there were um, too many occurrences of side products being detected which meant that the batch was uh, unsatisfactory. So in addition to reducing the cycle time of the batch, they wanted to be able to produce batches where um, failures were, were minimized. So for this project we used this uh, automate platform where there are four parallel reactors. Um, each reactor is fully independent, totally operated from software, so you could have four different temperatures being uh, run at the same time. The stirring speeds could be different, the feed rates could be different. So for all intents and purposes, four completely separate reactors, and therefore the ability to uh, basically do four experiments at a time. In terms of the um, uh, parameters that were identified, four were um, listed, so it's temperature, uh, the feed rate of component B, stirring speed, and the presence or absence of component C. The uh, temperature uh, was identified for the experiments was 4 and 16 degrees. This is based on the fact that the normal temperature was 10, so um, 6 degrees, degrees lower and 6 degrees higher. The normal feed rate was 0.14 grams a minute on this scale and therefore again we went down uh, below that and a little bit higher than that to give us the, the two uh, values at which we would uh, do the experiment. The stirring speed was just specified as being uh, fast and slow and then obviously for component C either there was um, uh, the component C was present or in, it was totally absent. So this is how we were going to do the experiment. So since there are 
um, for components, uh, for variables, then the two factorial design leads to a 16, a minimum of 16 experiments being necessary. And then you put that into the software and it basically spits out the list of experiments in the order in which um, you should do them. So, uh, for example, the first one would be at the higher temperature, the lower flow rate, high stirrer speed without any component C. The next one, you change the temperature, uh, change the feed rate, keep the stirrer speed and the uh, component C constant, and so on you go uh, in that way. So for each experiment, uh, here on the right-hand column, uh, you have the, uh, the batch time, uh, which we, is an important variable that we want to minimize. These figures in the, in the middle, I'm not going to focus on, although for this pro uh, project they were important. This is because the, uh, we were also doing calorimetry work to try and um, uh, sort of optimize the process from the safety viewpoint. But for this exercise, I'm going to ignore that. So basically, we did the 16 experiments. The others are not listed here and identified the, the uh, batch cycle times that we got. So just as an example, when we looked at feed rate, we went from 0.1 to 0.18 uh, grams a minute, and the batch time went down from around 99 to something like uh, 69 minutes. And then similarly for temperature, uh, when we went to the low to the high, you can see here how the, the batch time was, was reduced. So these are the kind of results and how we would express them. So at the end of this first set of experiments, we could identify that the, uh, the feed rate of the component B and the temperature uh, were statistically important in terms of determining the, the batch cycle time. Uh, we also identified that agitation seemed to be um, not important and also the effect or absence of C seemed to make little difference to the results. In addition to the batch cycle time, as I mentioned earlier, we also need to see uh, whether or not the uh, products were um, within acceptable quality. And so that's a piece of information that I uh, haven't uh, yet uh, expressed. So basically, the samples from each of the 16 um, tests were taken, analyzed uh, with a GC. And in fact, what we found was that all the materials, all the samples were within specification. Um, so what, it, what this means is that the range of conditions over which we uh, operated actually weren't uh, really wide enough um, because ideally what you want to do is to get results which are some of which are um, acceptable and some of which are not acceptable so you can try and identify the region or the, or the parameters which leads to uh, this division. So basically, uh, what it means is that if we think about the feed rate and the temperature, we need to operate over a wider temperature range and uh, a wider feed rate. So in other words, um, move to um, a region that's uh, shown here in order that uh, we can see where the, the optimum lies. So the next step would be to just focus on the two parameters that we've identified, namely temperature and feed rate. Um, and then um, uh, push these parameters to uh, a wider region, in other words, to higher values of both temperature and the feed rate. And then also in this particular case, we decided to do a central composite type of uh, design, in other words, add another uh, experiment uh, to supplement the, um, the low and the high values. So instead of just doing low temperature, high temperature, low feed, high feed, we've added another point here in the center to uh, allow us to define the optimal region um, in, in greater detail. So with the, with the new conditions, we basically have results like this. So here you've got the, uh, the new feed rate, um, 0.21 compared with 0.1 before, going up to 0.27 compared with only 0.18 before. And as the feed rate goes up, you can see the batch time comes down just as we found before. So um, actually, we can go a lot further in terms of the feed rate. When we look at the temperature here, the minimum now is 20, whereas previously we start, our higher was uh, 16. And you can see that actually now there's very little um, 
uh, influence of temperature on the batch cycle time. And this will happen with all semi-batch reactions when you go to a high enough temperature. This is basically telling us that um, the process is now uh, feed controlled. In other words, that the kinetics at these temperatures are very fast and therefore the uh, batch time isn't being influenced by temperature anymore, but just by the feed rate. So the results of this uh, second set of experiments can be expressed here. So here you've got feed rate and here temperature. And then on these lines are the uh, batch cycle times. Or more commonly, we can express this in this uh, sort of three-dimensional plot. So you've got temperature here, feed rate here, and then on the y-axis vertically, you've got the uh, batch cycle time, which is what we're trying to reduce. Um, so you've got a whole range of batch cycle times corresponding to uh, different uh, feed rates and, uh, and temperatures. And remember, what we have to identify in this area are the uh, points at which the uh, side products were within an acceptable range. And that's what's identified here in this little green box. So for this process, it means that the minimum batch cycle time can be achieved um, and the uh, product re re retains within quality as long as the temperature and feed rate remain uh, within the uh, conditions defined by this, uh, this green box. So that's our sort of optimal zone and the conditions under which we have to operate. So it means that in terms of the back cycle time, the temperature um, uh, is, not, uh, um, is no longer important because we've gone to a point where the kinetics are very fast, which then basically leaves just the feed rate uh, which governs the, uh, the cycle time. As far as the byproducts are concerned, we can control them um, by uh, choosing the lower range of this higher temperature range. Um, and if we go to a high temperature, then that's the only way in which uh, we get uh, failed samples. So it's a very clear, uh, clearly identified parameter now. And, uh, and so it allows the client to operate uh, reliably simply by having good control of temperature. Um, we can highlight now one of the um, sort of misconceptions that this particular client had, which was that they thought 12 degrees was the upper limit and that once you get above 12 degrees, you'll get failed batches. The reality is, in fact, you can go all the way to 20 and even a little bit above that, which increases your reaction time, reduces your uh, batch cycle without actually affecting the quality. Um, we also find that, in fact, this uh, component C, which was added, in fact, played no part in the quality or the batch time. So again, it could be eliminated, so the process is simplified. The batch cycle time has been reduced anyway. Um, and of course, we've generated a sort of a, a response a surface, which gives the client, um, which defines for the client a region over which um, they can operate without getting into difficulties. Um, so then overall, um, th the client gets a good understanding of the process limitations um, and how to stay within those uh, improved conditions. Um, the controlled reactor that we've used uh, is an important part of this because it gives re results that we could rely on and which could then be uh, reproduced on the plant. Um, and as you saw, we've used a parallel reactor in this particular case, and that's important principally for reducing the, um, uh, the development time. So we uh, were able to reduce this by a factor of four since we had uh, four parallel uh, reactors being used. The next example, again, is a, is a, is a plant-based optimization. Uh, again, a stirred uh, reactor, this time a solution of uh, acetophenone and uh, TOF, this is triethyl orthoformate in eth ethanol, uh, were charged to the reactor and then uh, gassed with hydrogen chloride at just above room temperature. Basically, the acetophenone um, uh, undergoes a series of uh, aldol uh, condensations and uh, elimination of water, and then uh, at the end, the uh, uh, product, product uh, precipitates out. So this is basically just showing uh, the, the sequence in which 
the reaction dissolves. So we're going from this uh, feed material uh, bubbling in the HCl, and then eventually we end up with the 135 triphenyl benzene as the desired product. And uh, here too, we have issues with the side reactions, so it's important and uh, that uh, this is kept uh, in mind as part of the uh, uh, objective. The current process um, gives 55% uh, yield uh, fairly reproducibly, and the objective here was to increase this, uh, this yield. And for this, we again used um, a, a parallel reactor. This is a, a variation on the last one. The last one was a linear uh, platform and the uh, automate, and this is a polyblock. But essentially, they have very similar features. The All the reactors are totally independent in terms of temperature, in terms of stirring. So this is just a much more compact footprint, which if the, if the experimental details are simple enough, uh, provides a much less expensive platform with which to do the parallel uh, experimentation. Uh, we did, in fact, do uh, a baseline experiment at the current uh, plant conditions here using this uh, uh, platform, and we found a yield of 54%, which um, is basically uh, a, re a replica of what they're getting on the plant. And this is an important thing, of course, in all cases, to be able to establish the, the, the baseline. So what we want to improve is the yield from the current value of 55%. And the uh, parameters identified uh, were the amount of TOF uh, from the current 1.2 equivalent, the amount of hydrogen chloride from the current 1.5 equivalent, the reaction temperature, which at the moment is typically 30 degrees C, and I have a, an analysis of the solvent. At the moment, the ethanol is the solvent uh, that is being used. So. As far as the temperature is concerned, the uh, values selected were 15 and 45 degrees C. The HCl molar equivalent, 0.75 and 2.25. Um, TOF molar equivalent, or 0.6 and 1.8. And, uh, and the solvents were IPA and, uh, and N-butanol. And uh, so these were the four parameters which would be studied in the first set of experiments. With the two factorial design, four parameters leads to a minimum of 16 experiments that need to be done. So here you have the list of experiments predicted by um, the uh, DOE software. So here are the temperatures, for example. Uh, here's the molar equivalence of HCl, of TOF, and then how the solvent would be selected. So IPA, butanol, IPA, butanol. And then eventually in the last column, we get the, um, uh, the results uh, for uh, the, um, uh, the conversion uh, or, the, or the yield, sorry. <clears throat> so that's our first set of results. First thing we notice is that even the best yield is lower than typically in the plant. So this is a little bit of a surprise. Uh, also, when you look at the results, it's not easy to do identify a trend in terms of what's uh, important or not. And so in this particular case, what we did was to uh, make use of a statistical technique which involves uh, a half normal plot. And, uh, and this helps to uh, identify um, parameters which are uh, important and distinguish them from those that are, are not important. And this is uh, such a plot. And basically what it uh, shows is that the TOF uh, concentration actually is the only significant parameter um, in this particular uh, process. And all the others basically um, <coughs> uh, are not significant at all in influencing the, the yield. So here, for example, is <coughs> how TOF uh, influences the yield. Uh, which goes in this particular case from 6.4% to something like 25-26%. So <clears throat> we can cl conclude, first of all, that the amount of TOF is, is a key variable. 
Uh, we can also conclude that the uh, concentration of hydrogen chloride, the reaction temperature, and, uh, and stirring are, um, are not key variables in determining the product yield. We uh, can also see that, in fact, because the uh, yields fall well short of the plant values, that um, possibly we should revert to ethanol again as the solvent rather than the two solvents that we used. So this was an assumption on our part that by uh, switching back to the plant um, solvent, uh, we would actually get um, back to the sort of plant conditions in terms of yield that um, we, were, we were experiencing. And so <clears throat> the next set of experiments would involve uh, working at a temperature of 30 and 60 degrees uh, HCL molar equivalents of 0.75 and uh, 2.25, so, so uh, and a TOF of 1.2 and 2.4. So we'd now work with the three parameters instead of four, using these as the as the variables, and do a new two factorial design to investigate these three remaining parameters. So this then gives rise to this list of experiments that uh, we'd have to do. So there are eight experiments to be done. And, uh, and then it gives rise to, okay, it gives rise to the results that are shown there. And you can see that now we're getting much closer to uh, the plant um, uh, yields uh, in, in the 50% in the uh, order. So clearly switching to the, uh, switching the solvent um, has made uh, the difference that we hoped for. So again, we can see that the TOF is, is important, um, but in fact what we find is that uh, it has a negative effect. In other words, when we increase the amount of TOF, uh, the yield actually goes down. Uh, we confirm that the hydrogen chloride and the temperature are not key variables in determining the yield. So uh, if hydrogen chloride is not a key variable, then of course we can cut down on it, and uh, and we cut down by 50%. This is already a process improvement, not only in terms of saving the uh, the cost of the the gas itself, but because it would um, make the process shorter, so the addition time would be reduced. So the next step, then, is really we're only left with one variable, TOF, so we can simply do uh, several experiments varying the amount of this, keeping the other conditions uh, 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 fixed, and, uh, and, then, and then we basically get this kind of result. So we're varying the TOF, and then we get a whole series of yields with all the other parameters fixed. Um, and you can see we've now gone through a maximum, so we can get close to 60% yield compared with about 55% on the plant. So we, we're finally getting to, uh, to where we want to. And this is just a plot of the final conclusion. So as we vary the molar equivalent of TOF, we actually go through a minimum of, uh, of roughly 60% yield. So we can also see that actually the amount of TOF you need is reduced compared with what was being used in the plant. So we've reduced uh, by 17% the TOF, we've reduced the amount of um, hydrogen chloride, and we've increased the yield by around 5%. Okay, now let's do the, the final um, example, case study four. This is uh, deliberately chosen to be a very different kind of process where we need high pressure equipment. Um, and we're looking at a, a process for making uh, cyclohexanone. Um, the traditional uh, method is basically to uh, oxidize cyclohexane. Um, and, but what we're going to look at is a different process whereby we can uh, use a hydrogenation process. And so we basically take phenol and we hydrogenate to cyclohexanone, which is the desired product. Uh, problem is if you're not careful to control that, then you can go all the way to the alcohol. Um, and uh, we came across a publication uh, where um, uh, working on a 1 ml scale with a Lewis acid in DCM, 
um, very good results were obtained for being able to uh, focus on the cyclohexanone uh, alone and not go on to uh, significant quantities of the alcohol. So we stated our objective as first of all scaling up the, um, uh, the results we found in the literature going from 1 ml to uh, something in the region of 10 to 100 milliliters in a stirred uh, reactor. So we wanted to go to stirred reactor and up to a volume that we felt uh, would um, illustrate the scalability of the, of, the, of the chemistry. And then optimize the conditions for, of course, the production of uh, cyclohexanone, but also we wanted to be able to see if we could um, also make the alcohol and thereby um, potentially have the ability to select which product you wanted to uh, make. The um, product used for this is shown here. This is a, a high-pressure chem scan, which is, again, a multi-reactor platform. There are eight parallel reactors in this case. Uh, we typically work at a volume of about six milliliters, stirred reactors, as you can see here, uh, working under pressure. Uh, each reactor at a separate temperature, separate pr pressure, individually stirred. So a completely independent um, uh, experimentation allowing us uh, to um, uh, optimize the conditions and study this reaction very, very quickly. Also, um, the hydrogen that we're feeding, we can actually monitor the consumption so we can see when the reaction is even finished. Uh, and we can, uh, as I said, monitor how much hydrogen is being consumed online. Um, and this basically shows the, the way in which we would do the experiment. So here you have the temperatures that we looked at, 40, 60, 80, um, and so on. And then here the two pressures that we worked at. So four of the reactors were at 30 bar, four of the reactors were at 40 bar, and then each one would be at one of the uh, two temperatures that we decided on. So this is how uh, the conditions would be selected. And uh, because the reactors are completely independent, we can actually look at eight conditions at the same time very, very easily. This is typical of the sort of results that you get. Um, here we're plotting just the conversion of phenol at different temperatures. So if this is the uh, results at 40 bar. Um, so we can get close to 100% conversion. And here are the results at uh, 30 bar. Again, we can get close to 100% conversion. This red point here is the value in the literature. Um, so the, the, they were able to get close to 100% at 30 bar. But as I said before, this is only on a one mil scale uh, and, uh, and on stead. Um, so certainly we can uh, get close to the performance. Um, this is uh, showing the product selectivity. So here we're focusing on cyclohexanone. Uh, so we have uh, 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 cyclohexanone selectivity here as a function of temperature at the two pressures. And you can see the pressure is not an important variable. And basically, at the lower temperatures, we can get close to 100% selectivity. If we wanted to make the, the alcohol, then basically, again, uh, pressure is not significant. But now we uh, can get uh, virtually 100% selectivity at the higher temperatures. So we can study this uh, uh, reaction and, uh, and very quickly um, reach um, important conclusions because of the parallel platform that we're using. So here are the comparisons with the literature value and our own studies at 30 bar and 40 bar. So conversion, in all cases, we can get close to 100% conversion. Uh, cyclohexanone, um, the literature got about 95%, and we're basically able to achieve the same. Um, in terms of the alcohol, in the literature, there was no uh, effort to make the alcohol, but by, switch, by changing the conditions, um, we can actually uh, get, again, 90, uh, close to 95% selectivity for the solvent as well. So this is an example of a parallel platform uh, for quantitative study of uh, pressure reactions, in this particular case, hydrogenation, uh, to very quickly 
uh, optimize the, the conditions. And that's basically um, it. So they, in the conclusion is basically that we can uh, develop processes and optimize them through use of DAE. And that's a well-established step. Um, the computer-controlled reactors basically work very well in conjunction with uh, the DOE technique. And, uh, and if you go to a parallel platform, of course, you can do execute the, uh, the uh, project in a, in a very timely manner as well. Um, so that's the, the, the key part of the presentation. I just want to uh, summarize the techniques the tools that uh, uh, were used in, uh, in these uh, examples that I mentioned. Uh, so in the first example, it was a stirred reactor, um, controlled temperature, stirring, liquid addition, uh, completely um, uh, uh, safety monitored, and, and uh, complete data logging. And you can see two reactors, a glass reactor, um, and then a similarly stirred reactor for pressure reactions, although we didn't use this kind of reactor in this project. We only used the glass one. Um, we can also uh, use a project, uh, products like this where you have two reactors, a uh, high and a low pressure one, uh, which gives you the flexibility to do chemistry um, at, uh, at both sorts of conditions. Uh, the parallel platforms, we used two, flat, uh, two uh, completely different platforms in the examples. One is this um, very compact platform, which is the Polyblock 4, uh, could have used the Polyblock 8, or this linear one, the Automate platform, uh, where basically they're uh, very similar in terms of functionality, completely independent reactors, computer controlled, and so on. It's just the ease of use if you've got a complex process uh, that is enabled by this automate platform, which would be uh, difficult. And then we switch to uh, the high pressure platform that we used. Here is the HP Chem Scan again, with uh, eight parallel reactors. Again, all completely independent. Um, there are also linear versions, in other words, automate versions um, of this uh, high pressure uh, reactors as well. So uh, this is just uh, shown for completeness here, um, and that's really. Um, uh, the end of the presentation. If you have any any questions right now, I'd be uh, happy to um, answer them. Um, but of course, you're you're welcome to drop me a line. You have my email. We can also speak on the phone if necessary. Um, and I believe Paresh is going to send you PDFs of um, of, of the PowerPoint that I used anyway. Um, I have a, a question here that says uh, where you couldn't hear. I can't. I don't know. Oh, I see. Component C could be important in defining the quality of the product or reducing the full motion of side products. Yes, this is you know what we we had assumed, but uh, in fact. Uh, the client's own, the, the, all the analytical work was done by the client themselves, and they were the ones who um, came to the conclusion that uh, there was no significance to this uh, product anymore. I can only assume that things have changed over time, and that um, in the early stages, Component C did play an important part, probably in the way that um, uh, you are suggesting uh, uh, in, in terms of the quality, and perhaps um, this was no longer important, but people hadn't thought to uh, review the process and, and therefore eliminate uh, um, the component C. Are there any more questions before we finish? As I say, don't hesitate to drop us an email. And of course, uh, you have uh, our uh, contacts in the various regions that you can uh, also approach in the first place. But uh, feel free to um, um, uh, drop your line directly if you, if you think uh, that would be uh, easier. Right, thank you very much uh, for, for joining us. And, uh, and I hope you found it uh, useful.